the fascist states of America. Since this United case, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. With almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk. I'm the host of this series of half-hour weekly cable television programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media in Portland, Oregon. The Alliance for Democracy is a citizens activist uh, organization movement of progressive populists seeking to end corporate domination. If you agree with us that the ever-increasing presence of corporate money and corporate lobbyists in the political processes here in the United States undermines our ability to be a sovereign, self-governing people, then you should consider joining the Alliance for Democracy. More information on the Alliance for Democracy is available at either the national website, www.thealliancefordemocracy.org, or at our Portland chapter website at www.afd-pdx.org. So today we are going to welcome back David Cobb. David was our guest last week and we were talking about corporate personhood. Just as a reminder, David is uh, an attorney having graduated from the University of Houston Law School in 1993. In 2002, he ran for attorney general on the Green Party ticket in Texas. Uh, his uh, major platform was that uh, if he was elected, he wanted to use the power of the office to revoke corporate charters when they did wrong. In 2004, he was the presidential candidate for the Pacific Green Party. And uh, following the um, January 21, 2010, United Supreme, United, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision called Citizens United versus the FEC. He jumped in as, uh, as an advocate for democracy uh, to be the spokesperson for Move to Amend.org, uh, an organization set up to amend the Constitution to make clear that the rights enumerated in the Constitution are for people and not for corporations. So we're going to continue our conversation with David Cobb talking about corporate personhood. Welcome to the show again. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. And once again, I just want to remind folks that the only reason you're hearing this conversation uh, about the appropriate role of corporations in our democracy is because you're watching uh, people's media. Uh, Portland Community Media is a source of non-corporately filtered news information and analysis. Uh, so you're actually getting an honest-to-goodness conversation about what's really going on in the world. Remember that in mainstream media, what I like to call corporate media, you might get 
get great sports coverage, you're, you'll get great entertainment, but when it comes to news, you're mostly getting what the corporate masters want you to hear. It's mostly a bunch of propaganda. Here, you'll actually get unfettered information and analysis. Great, good, thank you for, thank you for that plug. That's, uh, that's exactly what our purpose is. All right. Thank you, All right, yeah. So uh, at, at the last show, we were talking about the Citizens United case. Can you just give us a real quick recap of what that, what that case was? Sure, in January of 2010, the United States Supreme Court uh, basically overturned the McCain-Feingold campaign finance laws at the federal level uh, on the basis that those very anemic, very weak laws uh, treated corporations as an oppressed minority, uh, and now go both corporations and trade unions and wealthy individuals can spend unlimited amounts of money in what are known as independent expenditures. They have flooded the, the political process uh, with bil literally billions of dollars uh, and made it virtually impossible for we the people to actually have a democratic conversation during our election process. Mm -hmm. okay. And so there, I forget exactly what your term was, but uh, essentially the Supreme Court felt that corporations are being discriminated against? Yeah, that's right. They, tr yeah. they, they claim that corporations are treated as an oppressed minority. An oppressed minority. Uh, and of course, this is simply outrageous, David. And it's yet another example of the United States Supreme Court uh, working against the interest of ordinary people on behalf of the ruling elite and using the illegitimate illogical, completely stupid idea that somehow concentrated capital uh, uh, should have legal personhood rights. Remember that the United States Constitution protects the rights of human beings individually against uh, uh, their own government. Government should never have the right to actually infringe upon human beings' individual human rights. But anytime we the people pass environmental health laws, safety laws, worker protection laws, those laws should not be overturned merely because the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't like the, the, the effect. Mm -hmm. So we're going back two and a half centuries to try and figure out what the founding fathers uh, thought about corporations. Did they, did they think about corporations? Well, they, the history? Well, they certainly did, David. I mean, uh, the reality is uh, uh, the, the founders understood very well what corporations were. Uh, the first 13 colonies were mostly corporations, in fact. In a very real way, we can understand that the American Revolution is not only a revolution against uh, the monarchy, against the idea of the divine right of kings, uh, but it's also a people's uprising against corporate rule. Uh, remember that the East India Corporation uh, was one of the main uh, business entities that was colonizing uh, uh, this country. Uh, in fact, it's worth pointing out that the, the American Revolution itself was a, 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 a reaction to uh, incredibly oppressive trade laws that were being passed in England on behalf of the East India uh, uh, corporation and and a hundred percent of all of the members of parliament in England were actually shareholders in the oh. East India Corporation. So, you know, the, the founders were very clear and very, understood very well uh, what corporations were. And it's worth remembering, David Delk, that the the uh, first corporations that were chartered after the American Revolution were very tightly controlled. Before you could actually get a charter in this country for the first 75 years, you had to prove that there was a public need that was not being met. You had to get a bill passed by both houses of Congress and the governor sign it, so it was the functional equivalent of a law. Uh, you, that corporate charter would only be good for 10 to 20 years, at which point it automatically dissolved. and. All you could do with that corporate charter was the very specific uh, public need that you had alleged was not being met, either by government or existing business. And lastly, if you were ever found to act outside the public interest in any way, you were subject to having your corporate charter revoked even before that 10 to 20 year period. So yes, our, our founders understood very well what corporations were and very tightly controlled those corporations. I'm not saying this was the land of milk and honey for those Africans who were enslaved. It wasn't the land of milk and honey for women who were treated like chattel property. It wasn't great for the working class men of this country who were subject to indentured servitude. But the corporation as an instrument was very tightly controlled. And I heard you speak recently and you 
uh, Gay White, I thought was an astonishing figure on the number of people who were actually regarded as citizens at that time. Yes, uh, if you actually consider uh, that in order to be a full legal person in 1789, when the United States Constitution uh, was ratified, uh, you had to be a wealthy, white, male landowner. If you actually look at all of the adult population of the 13 colonies, five to seven percent of the adult humans living in those 13 colonies actually qualified to actually be fully vested citizens. So the, the rhetoric of the founding of the United States is phenomenal and it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a promise that, that uh, I hold dear to my heart and I want to make the promise of a democratic republic a reality. But in its inception, the founding of this country is a founding violence against the indigenous who were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. It's a founding violence against women who were not only, it's not just that women couldn't vote, David, it's that women were property themselves. They were subjugated. It's a founding violence against working class white people, uh, white men who were not fully uh, persons. So um, I guess it's worth remembering the, the great words of the immortal Howard Zinn, who said, in one respect, the entire history of the United States can be understood as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be legally defined as persons under the Constitution. Right. And this is really what all of the great social movements in the United States have, have been about, is increasing the number of people that are regarded as actually being citizens, as being people. David, I think that's right. I mean, uh, whether you look at the American Revolution itself, or the women's suffrage movement, or the abolitionist movement, the trade union movement, the civil rights movement, at their core, they are all democracy movements, because democracy means the people rule or the people have power. All of these movements were ordinary people coming together to organize to be able to exercise actual political power. So every great social movement so far in the United States really have been uh, stages of the democracy movement. And there have been great victories so far, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet. And that's why the Alliance for Democracy is so important and the effort at Move to Amend is so important because we believe we need the next phase of the democracy movement. We need to make the promise of democracy and a democratic republic a reality. And I'm encouraging viewers of this program, the Progressive Dialogues, or the Populist Dialogues, and uh, viewers of Portland Community Media to please go to the website at www.movetoamend.org and join over 100,000 people who were calling for a constitutional amendment to make it clear that corporations are not persons, they do not have inherent constitutional rights, only living, breathing human beings can claim those wonderful protections under our Constitution. Okay. Yeah. So we had, we had this perception of, of, um, of the original founders uh, about corporations and the corporations were very controlled, uh, very regulated. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, uh, you know, first of all, let's remember that uh, even in our sanitized American history textbooks, uh, there was an age that was known as the age of the robber barons. Mm -hmm. This is the age when literally uh, legislation was bought and paid for at state capitals across the country at the federal level as well. So what you, you had... Give us a time period for that for uh, those who might not know. We're, we're talking about basically uh, the 1890s through the, uh, the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, and during that time period, what you had were uh, very well the individuals going in and buying legislation and so uh, point by point uh, restrictions at the state level that were controlling corporations were being overturned legislatively and at the same time as if that's not enough cor uh, transnational corporations were hi were hiring lawyers to go into court and argue that even laws they couldn't get overturned uh, were unconstitutional on their face. And remember that this is a time when the courts were saying women are not people and therefore laws that prevented women from voting were constitutionally acceptable under the 14th Amendment and did not violate the Equal Protection Clause. At the same time, that comes down the pike, the, corpora uh, the corporations are able to argue that they are persons with constitutional rights to overturn uh, other laws that affect the corporation. So it's a complete example of the utter um, disregard that the U.S. Supreme Court sometimes has for facts or logic or, or reasoning. 
And, and so these are these uh, the, the the right wing talks about activist judges all the time, <laughs> right? And these are really these are prime examples of where we have had activist judges ruling in the favor of corporations and against all of us. D David, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, remember that the whole idea of an activist judge uh, occurs any time that a judge supplants her or his uh, opinion for the uh, the the will of the people through the legislative process. The only time that the court should ever overturn a law passed through the democratic process is if that law actually does violate the inherent sacrosanct uh, rights uh, of a human being. For example, I would argue any law that attempts to prevent women from voting, that law on its face is unconstitutional because it violates a woman's right. Likewise, the Jim Crow segregation laws of the South, any law that, uh, that, that uh, violates those uh, rights of African Americans should have been overturned, and of course, it took 75 years of organizing uh, before those laws were overturned. Uh, but the idea that the courts can overturn laws attempting to protect our environment, to protect workers, to protect the integrity of our elections, uh, to basically allow we the people to create the society that we want to live in, that is not only an activist judge, but that's a runaway judge. That's, that is tantamount to fascism. And I think it's worth remembering that Benito Mussolini, one of the, one of the great champions of the idea of fascism, proudly said, fascism more properly should be called corporatism because it merges the economic might of our mighty corporations with the fantastic might of the nation state. And he was proud of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. <laughs> right, yeah. So I, th I think one of the things we need to make a, a distinction about is about corporations that operate on a multi state, national level or multinational level versus the corporation that is doing something at a local level. Well, you know, David, I'm glad that you bring up that point because the group that I work with, Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County, we champion local independent businesses. We, we actually run a, a local independent business alliance, I think and hope that there is one in Portland. Uh, and we are for commerce. We support commerce. We are for appropriate commerce. And Local independent businesses are the heart and soul of the Portland economy, and they are the heart and soul of the economy throughout the country. It's worth pointing out that the major Fortune 500 corporations have been a net loser of jobs uh, over the last decade. The only thing keeping this economy afloat are actually the growth of worker cooperatives and local independent businesses. So you, there's a huge distinction between those two. and. The only time that any corporation ever claims that their constitutional rights are violated is when a huge transnational corporation wants to overturn laws. So-called mom and pops never do that. They just never exercise their rights. There's a distinction between corporate constitutional rights and limited liability. So don't confuse those two topics. The last thing while we're on the topic I want to remind people is that when you spend a dollar in a local independently owned and operated business, that dollar will circulate on average seven times in your local community. That same dollar spent at a corporate franchise will operate, circulate about two and a half up to three times before it leaves your community. It really matters where we spend our money. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the, the, some of the specific uh, decisions on the part of the Supreme Court, like the Santa Clara. Um, okay. So Santa Clara was decided uh, in 1886, and it, it, this is a decision, and it's actually shrouded in mystery. And I want to uh, let folks know, if you want to actually learn more about that specific decision, the first time that the idea uh, of a corporation ever having constitutional right, uh, that is described by our friend Tom Hartman in a fantastic book called Unequal Protection, The Rise of Corporate Dominance and the Theft of Human Rights. Uh, this book actually outlines that. And in that decision, uh, in a head note uh, to that decision, the, uh, the, the justices are alleged to have said, uh, we are not going to, dis to, to argue or, or if corporations have constitutional rights or persons, we are of the opinion that it does. Uh, that rationale was allegedly used uh, in order to overturn a taxing system where corporate 
landowners were taxed differently than ordinary individual human landowners. Why? Because the railroad corporations were, were uh, spewing smoke and causing fires by allowing railroads to come across the, the property. So it was something very sim simple. Uh, there have been other cases, Leggett versus uh, Lee, for example, where uh, the, the state uh, our local community tried to tax the big uh, corporate department stores differently than the so-called mom and pops on the basis that, well, it's better. We want to encourage uh, local mom and pops because they contribute more to the economy. They're better, et cetera. And the court overturned that decision. Uh, likewise, the, the, the court uh, overturned environmental protection laws of OSHA um, in Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahon. I mean, there are pro I could probably list 30 or 40 cases off the top of my head where different types of laws have been overturned, all ultimately on the basis that corporations somehow have inherent constitutional rights that cannot be violated by the democratic process. And folks, that's crazy. Yes, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. So c can you tell us what specific rights corporations have been given by these activist judges? Oh, my God. Well, they have been, uh, it has been asserted that corporations have the First Amendment right to free speech. It has been asserted that corporations uh, have the rights uh, to uh, a, a trial by jury. It has been asserted that uh, corporations have the rights of equal protection. It has been asserted that uh, corporations uh, have the rights to privacy. I mean, the number of rights that, that uh, and again, it's important to remember that I'm not anti-corporation. A corporation is just a business. It's just an entity. What I am saying is this, and we at MoveToAmend.org are saying is corporations should never be allowed to overturn any laws based on some alleged violation of their inherent human rights. Corporations don't have inherent rights. Any rights that a corporation does have is subject to the democratic process and can be changed through the legislative will. Your rights, David Delk, does not act, are not actually uh, subject to the democratic process. That's what it means to have an inherent right. Uh, and I think that it's important uh, to understand that the Constitution doesn't create rights. The Constitution is supposed to only recognize rights. And any time the democratic process does try to overturn our inherent rights, it's appropriate for the court to overturn that law. And may I suggest, with respect, if I want to marry a man, I have the inherent constitutional right to do that. Uh, and any law at the state level that purports to take that right away from me is invalid on its face. And that's the kind of law that ought to be overturned in court. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I actually, I was going, I was also thinking about because I'm gay, and and one of the one of the you know current issues is about gay marriage, mm -hmm. uh, which appears to me that that should be covered under the Fourth Fourteenth Amendment, uh, uh, equal protection and, and due process and. And let's be clear, it is. I mean, on its face, the argument that somehow you're going to treat people with a different sexual orientation differently under law is a facial violation of the equal protection argument. Uh, and so it is appropriate for courts to overturn that. Now, it's not saying that uh, uh, those of us who want to marry same-sex people should have the right to force the church to marry us. Mm -hmm. But at the, uh, at the level of the state, the state should not, and in fact, cannot legitimately deny the right of same-sex people to enjoy the same protections under law. That is unconstitutional. Great. Okay, good. I, I, I was hoping for a really clear statement. You make really good, clear statements. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. So there was another decision. Uh, actually, this was from the Mich uh, Michigan Supreme Court called Dodge versus Ford. Oh, I'm glad you bring up this case, David. This is a, an incredible uh, decision. Uh, for the first time, the, uh, the courts held that the only reason that a corporation exists is to, quote, maximize profits for its shareholders. We have been taught to believe that that is the whole purpose of the creation of the corporation, but it's not true. Uh, that is nothing more than a, uh, a decision by the Michigan Supreme Court that has been picked up and has been uh, uh, shoved through the court system. But Dodge versus Ford Motor Company stands for that proposition. Before that, corporations actually were supposed to be working in the public interest, and they were supposed to actually be public, quasi-private, quasi-public institutions that could only exist as long as they were working in the public interest. So that's a perfect example of activist judges 
changing uh, the whole role of the corporation and has been part of the reason that corporations have become the dominant institutions of our culture. Okay, great. And what do we need? Really quickly, what do we need to do to reverse all of these activist judges' decisions? All right, first of all, we need a constitutional amendment uh, to make it clear that money is not speech and corporations are not persons. Only human beings have constitutional rights. But even deeper, we need a democracy movement in the United States of America. And if this conversation has been appealing to you, if you'd like to learn more about this, I want to personally invite you to a weekend strategy retreat that we're hosting at Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County. It'll be October 7th through the 9th in beautiful Humboldt County, California. Uh, go to our website at www.duhc.org or call the Move to Amend office at 707-269-0984. Sign up for this strategy session because what we need, David Delk, is what the Alliance for Democracy is calling for, which is a nonviolent revolution in this country, a people's movement to take our country back. Very good. Thank you very much. Up on our screen now, you see some additional information sources about corporate personhood. Move to Amend, of course, Democracy Unlimited in Humboldt County, Reclaim Democracy, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and of course our own National Alliance for Democracy website. So I invite you all there to do, do some deeper research on this. We uh, held up the one book. We have another book here also of interest to uh, you called The Gangs of America, The Rise of Corporate Power and the Disabling of Democracy. Uh, this is an excellent book, and I highly recommend that, uh, that you take a look at this book and read it. So that's going to close out our show today. Thank you very much. This has been an excellent program, and I appreciate your being our guest. Thank you, David. Great, good. Uh, before we go, uh, I do want to make note of an upcoming event here in Portland. This is going to be on April 16th. It will be at noon at Pioneer Courthouse Square. It is a rally in a march demanding jobs. We need jobs. We need to know where they're at. So far, the uh, efforts have been to, um, to uh, make whole Wall Street instead of making whole Main Street. And we need to have jobs. And we need to stop focusing. We need the federal government to stop focusing on deficit reduction and instead to focus on creating jobs for all of us. January 16th at noon, Pioneer Courthouse Square in downtown Portland on April 16th. So with that, I think we will say goodbye. Uh, I do need to thank our crew. Our crew today uh, is Joan Horton, Janice Morris, Roger Bates, and Dave King. And without them being here, we wouldn't be on the air, so thank you very much. We hope that we'll see you next time.